So this is a panel designed to talk about the uh, 20th anniversary of the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia, which was, uh, well, it was founded pretty much 20 years ago in, in August, 20 years ago. And uh, it was um, first hosted by the Gama Festival in Arnhem Land. And there's a whole story about how that started and why it started that we will get in today. But firstly, to introduce our panelists, um, Professor Alan Marrett of the University of Sydney, Australia, is Emeritus Professor of Musicology at the University of Sydney and uh, is still active in research as a chief investigator on the project Intercultural Inquiry in a Transnational Context, exploring the legacy of the 1948 American Australian Scientific Expedition to Arnhem Land. He has done a huge number of things in his life and career, including, I think, somewhat safe to say, um, uh, building, I guess, the entire genre of um, research into Australian Indigenous song and dance traditions as we know it today from the 1980s onwards. Uh, and also, Alan, you've worked also on um, um, Japanese and Chinese music too, historically as well, historical, the, the, the Sino-Japanese split. So you're quite well known for that as well. Uh, Marcia Langton has rejoined us. Thank you, Marcia. And I did introduce you before, but I will introduce you again now because these will be separated as different recordings down the track. Marcia Langton, uh, Professor Marcia Langton, Order of Australia, is an Aboriginal woman of Eman descent. She's an anthropologist and geographer with a strong research track record on Australian Aboriginal, um, on Aboriginal alcohol use and harms, family violence, Aboriginal land tenure, management of environments and native title, and aspects of Aboriginal culture, art and performance, and the shift to modernity. She has held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since 2000 and was appointed Associate Provost here in 2017. And she is chair, amongst other things, of the study group hosting, partially hosting this symposium, the International Council for Traditional Music Study Group on Indigenous Music and Dance. Thank you for being with us. Um, Dr. Payland Ford from Charles Darwin University, Australia, is a senior research fellow in the Northern Institute. Her knowledge, expertise and research focus on Indigenous issues and her work contributes to understanding locally, nationally and internationally. She graduated with her PhD in education in 2006 from Deakin University and she has won three, three Australian Research Council Indigenous Discovery grants, uh, as well as working on areas such as fisheries, uh, biosecurity, and a range of other things. So thank you for being with us today, Pay. Associate Professor Sally Treloyne of the University of Melbourne, Australia is an ARC Future Fellow and Associate Professor in Ethnomusicology and Intercultural Research in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music here. She's co-director of the Research Unit for Indigenous Arts and Cultures at the Willen Centre for Indigenous Arts and Cultural Development and plays a strategic role in the Indigenous research and research training agenda of the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music and I would also argue the entire university. Um, our two final um, presenters, uh, one is pre-recorded and I'll introduce him last. The other is sitting here. Finally, sitting here on the panel with us, Professor Brian Jungadoy Gumbla Garwicha is a Gupapoingal clan leader uh, from the Yungo nations of Northeast Arnhem Land in the north of Australia. And he's also one of our professors in the Indigenous Knowledge Institute. He's an Indigenous Knowledge Institute fellow here at the University of Melbourne. He's a musician in the early Arnhem Land popular band Soft Sands and his visual arts is displayed in the National Maritime Museum in Australia. 
and he's long engaged in research on cultural language, language and heritage, um, and holds a master's degree of Indigenous knowledges from Charles Darwin University. And uh, there's currently a lot of exciting work being done uh, by Brian here at the university, both in tracing Yolngu engagements with Southeast Asian seafarers through, through the port of Makassar mm. in Indonesia, and also into our um, collections, which feature Yolngu cultural heritage quite prominently. Finally, the pre-recorded guest um, is Professor Wantari Jumpy Jempa mm. Pawel. He's also an Indigenous Knowledge Institute mm. fellow at the university. Melbourne and creative director of the Milbury Festival at Large Amano. So that is all the introductions done. It's quite a large panel. So what we were going to do for this panel is basically field a series of questions that um, hopefully people can answer. The questions are somewhat open-ended, but it's a way into audiences who uh, don't necessarily know about, you know, the space that we work in together, what is actually important about it and why it's going on. So I mentioned before the National Reporting Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia started effectively at a symposium convened by Professor Marcia Langton, who's here, Professor Alan Merritt, who's here, and the late Mandawa Yunapingu of the famous Australian band of the Indy at the Gama Festival in August 2002. And there was a very positive, strong, and I think um, committed push to making sure that that actually happened and that the prominence of Indigenous song and dance traditions, which is often overlooked uh, in Australian culture, was made, you know, more central to the collective efforts across research and community sector organisations. So, Marcy, you were talking slightly before about the importance of Indigenous song and dance in Australia. Why, why do you think it was so important at the beginning that when people came together 20 years ago, they really, really wanted to see the formation of a national reporting project for Indigenous performance? What, what's so important about those traditions and why is that something you think that people wanted at the time? Thank you, Aaron. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of Nam, where I live and work. Uh, it's a great honour to be here at this panel. Um, as you know, and Alan too, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we joined forces to set up the National Recording Program for Indigenous Music and Performance because each of us had observed um, and were very uh, aware of Mundawoy's concerns also about the loss of uh, traditional music styles with the passing of each senior song man or woman who was the leader of one of these styles. From memory, at the time, we were terribly concerned about the fate of um, one of the styles in Western Arnhem Land where the one remaining singer in in in, in one particular uh, language group and ritual group was was very ill and uh, it was a particularly fascinating um, style um, and and we'd all seen the decline of music traditions, the ancient music traditions with the passing of song men and women. And we also understood the significance of this um, because uh, we then went on uh, to write during the course of our meeting at Gulkala, hosted by Mandawoy, the late Mandawoy Yunapingu, um, to write the, the Gama Statement on Indigenous Music and Dance. That was 20 years ago. And I think the statement explains our concerns very well. So I'll just read it. Yeah. Songs, dances 
and ceremonial performances form the core of Yolngu and other Indigenous cultures in Australia. It is through song, dance and associated ceremony that Indigenous people sustain their cultures and maintain the law and a sense of self within the world. Performance traditions are the foundation of social and personal well-being. And with the ever-increasing loss of these traditions, the toll grows every year. The preservation of performance traditions is therefore one of the highest priorities for Indigenous people. Indigenous songs should also be a deeply valued part of the Australian cultural heritage. They represent the great classical music of this land. These ancient musical traditions were once everywhere in Australia and now survive as living traditions only in several regions. Many of these are now in danger of being lost forever. Indigenous performances are one of our most rich and beautiful forms of artistic expression, and yet they remain unheard and invisible within the national cultural <clears throat> heritage. Without immediate action, many Indigenous music and dance traditions are in danger of extinction with potentially destructive consequences for the fabric of Indigenous society and culture. The recording and documenting of the remaining traditions is a matter of the highest priority, both for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Many of our foremost composers and singers have already passed away, leaving little or no record. And so that was 20 years ago uh, when we unanimously uh, agreed to that statement and published it and established the National Recording Project uh, in the light of those understandings. Um, and we were able then, uh, with the great work of uh, late Mundawai Yunipingu, Alan, Professor Alan Marrett and yourself uh, and uh, our colleagues from around the country, both traditional singers and ethnomusicologists and people who work with traditional singers to bring together people almost on an annual basis for the last 20 years uh, to share uh, our work from, from each year. And I think we've made some progress in, mm -hmm. in bringing to uh, an understanding in Australia uh, mm -hmm. for Australians and globally the treasure trove of music and performance that's inherited here from the ancient past by Indigenous people. Um, I think our efforts have paid off. Uh, we've managed to get recognition of these forms of music, uh, for instance, in major yeah. institutions. Um, what does that mean? Awareness of uh, their unique value. Uh, in our, I think, in, a, in, in the community uh, and uh, the media and our uh, governmental institutions, not to the extent that we would like, and this is why we're still here, uh, and, and then this national recording program led to the development of the International Council of Traditional Music study group on traditional music and performance. So uh, I think I've explained why we did it, the significance of our work and uh, why we keep doing it. I'm really glad you read the statement, Marcia. I'm really glad you, that the, the, they're powerful words still today from 20 years ago. I said there would be one question for each person. I'd, I really want to give you a follow-up question, but why don't we just see how much time we have at the end? But the one question I will throw out to everybody to think about moving forward is that we were worried 20 years ago and that worry was coming from uh, traditional knowledge bearers themselves. Are we still worried? 
And if we're not as worried as we were, then should we be? Anyway, that's an open question. Next um, is Professor Alan Marrett. Alan, so you were instrumental to seeing a need uh, for this initiative and uh, actually, you know, procured the initial resource for my access, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, uh, to make that first meeting possible in 2002. It's a simple question that probably has a long answer, but 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 how did you come up with this idea? Why did you see the need for that at the time? Uh, thank you, Aaron, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you this morning um, uh, from Adelaide um, in the traditional unceded lands of the Ghana people, and I wish to pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge and pay respect, my respects to all Indigenous people who are with us um, today. Um, Mars has just outlined, um, uh, and and Aaron as well, um, uh, something about the um, the beginning of the national recording project, and that was something that I was also going to talk about because um, I feel very much that um, whatever my own personal motivations were um, in. Um, in beginning a discussion, particularly with um, with Marcia and Aaron and uh, and Mandavoy, um, the really important thing was um, the bringing together of uh, traditional performers from endangered traditions across from various communities across northern Australia with um, to bring them together with um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers, um, as well as representatives of some of the major uh, institutions um, like IATSIS um, and like the National Library, in order to, to work out a way forward. Um, I was very aware of the fact that up to that point, many of the research priorities um, that were driving research into Aboriginal um, song and dance um, were the were the priorities of the um, usually non-indigenous researchers. And I thought it was about time that the research should reflect the priorities of the people who actually held the traditions. So that's why we brought everybody together. And I think reflecting on it, that that very act of bringing everybody together was really important. And it's something that, it, that we're, here we are, <laughs> 20 years later, um, uh, we're still coming together. Um, over the past 20 years, um, this symposium, um, which is you know an annual event, which came out of that very first one, has given an opportunity for people to um, reflect on research priorities, to present um, their work um, and to refine um, what we do, um, mm -hmm. not just in terms of our, um, our technical professional <laughs> ways of doing things, um, but finding ways um, to work that reflect um, mm -hmm reflect the priorities of the people who actually um, hold these hold these traditions. Um, so um, I'm very glad too that Marcia read out the um, the, the Ghana statement on Indigenous mm -hmm. music and dance that came out of that meeting. I think mm -hmm. it was very it was very important. Um, it still reads um, mm -hmm. very powerfully. Um, I think one of the core messages of that statement was the mm. vital role that the ceremonial arts of song and dance and visual design play, um, not just in the cohesion of um, Indigenous societies, but also um, in the health and well-being um, of the members of these societies. And I think it's important at this moment now, where this sort of great moment, 
where we're um, considering the establishment of mm. Indigenous Voice to Parliament mm. to realise that when when the institutions that are making decisions um, in Australia get to really hear the voice of Indigenous people, then they will begin to understand something which in many ways is still not penetrated, that that Indigenous song and dance is not entertainment. You know, it can be entertainment, of course, but it's much, much deeper than that. Um, it really... Um, is, uh, is something that is vital to the um, ongoing um, health and well-being of Aboriginal people and for the continuation um, of uh, these wonderful traditions that um, go back to the to the ancestral to the ancestral past. Um, there are many successes that um, I think we could reflect on um, in, in terms of uh, what has come out of the out of out of that first meeting. One of the things that always intrigues me is the way in which um, the outcomes of um, of a project such as this are so. Twenty years later, we can see they're so completely different from what we imagined they would be at the time. We couldn't have imagined um, the extent, the emergence of Indigenous scholars to the extent that we have, you know, beginning um, with um, um, Dr. Gumbala's um, uh, um, first um, uh, um, fellowship, um, Indigenous fellowship that recognised um, Indigenous knowledge as a basis for um, for awarding fellowships in the Australian academic system, um, and that has gone that has gone on, and we have some of those people um, these these uh, um, the people with us today, um, wonderful Indigenous scholars uh, who are yeah. able to um, pursue. Um, their um, their research priorities and the priorities of their mm. communities and thereby enrich enriching us all. And I've also been, um, I think it's, it's wonderful the way in which collaboration has become um, uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, scholars um, and between Indigenous and Indigenous scholars has become the norm. Um, uh, things have really shifted in 20 years. Uh, I don't think um, I don't think research in this space can really go forward uh, anymore without that collaboration. And we've this is really a tradition that we've built, and I think we should be proud of. And I think that it's something that we can also present to the international community as as an achievement. And right. the other thing is the last final thing that I'd mention is the is the emergence of um, so many wonderful. Um, young scholars, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, there are too many to mention, and it would probably, uh, I probably wouldn't do to be singling people out, except that I would like to mention, because I think it's a major achievement, um, the fact that um, uh, Dr, uh, well, Professor Clint Bracknell, Professor of Linguistics at the University of Queensland, last week um, was admitted as a fellow um, to the Australian Academy of the Humanities, which I thought was a, um, a really, uh, really wonderful moment. Um, uh, I think it's true to say he's the first Indigenous performer who has actually been a performer and scholar who has been um, recognised in that way. So that's probably more than enough from me. Um, I'll stop there. Um, and um, yeah, and I look forward to hearing what other people say. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so let's keep moving because I fear that we might run out of time. So Sally, the next question to you was, what are some of the key lessons that you have learned from the past 20 years? You were sort of starting your research as all this was getting going, if I remember correctly. So over to you, thanks. 
thanks so much, Aaron, and to Marcia and, uh, and everyone here. Um, yeah, I was uh, just beginning as a research assistant to the, to the National Recording Project in its first few years, but then later went on to organise some uh, symposia and uh, service coordinator mm -hmm. and uh, have en enjoyed an association um, for much of those last two decades. Um, mm -hmm. I just say that it's an honour to be here, part of this panel, um, for the occasion of 20 years of the National Recording Project. Um, I, of course, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples on whose unceded lands uh, this meeting's being hosted, um, as well as all Indigenous peoples present. Um, I'm here in Toronto, Canada, so I respectfully acknowledge elders and families of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I'm quite humbled to be here. Um, I guess I formally joined the National Recording Project in 2005, having recently returned to Sydney from study with master musicians and composers of the Junba tradition in the Northern Kimberley, um, studying with Mananambara, Paddy Nyawara, Scotty Martin, Pansy Nogat and others. Um, yeah. In 2002, the National Recording Project statement on Indigenous performance that Marcia yeah. um, read for us earlier um, had set a challenge. Yeah. And I think I took as a, something I took as a directive um, to record and document um, uh, under the direction of custodians and appropriate um, traditional owners for the sake of preservation uh, or as a strategy for preservation and sustainability. Um, I, I'd already seen some of the benefits of this approach uh, when I'd returned to Sydney and since have seen how recordings have been used in a raft of, raft of ways to support initiatives of continuance and revitalization. Um, and we see the role that recordings play in, um, in the state of Jumba today at festivals and so on. However, sitting in Sydney in 2005, having really just returned from the Kimberley, um, writing a thesis um, and corresponding with and posting cassette tapes at the time back to the Kimberley, um, I'd also been grappling with the real and um, philosophical limitations of recording and documentation in the context of the live, live realities of Joomba custodians trying to keep Joomba and people well. Um, so in my... Um, the remainder of my five minutes here, I just want to um, reflect very briefly on the contributions of the National Recording Project. Um, in terms of recording documentation and the challenge of sustainability, but also in terms of lessons learned about what, what this requires of research and universities and things we might be attentive to as we go forwards. So firstly, um, from my perspective, I think the role of recording and documentation in music sustainability requires us to be quite constantly attentive. Um, as the statement sets out, Indigenous authority and leadership are critical. But further, as the context and ways in which recordings are used in community have proliferated, the importance of co-creating frameworks for practitioners to do the recording and documentation has also become more and more apparent. And that was, of course, uh, actually flagged in the statement. Uh, master teachers record from one perspective um, and master learners from another. Um, recording and documentation as processes, not just products for future reference in this context, may be an extension of the practice being recorded and may be a way to support the intended use by community into the future. Simultaneously and related to this, um, uh, I am always aware of the need to be uh, attentive to diverse kinds of Indigenous research expertise. Um, ways of sustaining performance traditions are as diverse as the traditions and the context in which they are practiced. Uh, the significance of this expertise is marked by community researchers taking a larger place in research design and funding applications. And as, um, as uh, Alan's just discussed in the growing number of indigenous researchers using the disciplinary spaces of the university and collection institutions to advance their causes of sustainability. This really challenges universities to question assumptions about the nature of research methods, research investment, and also the siloing of disciplines. And finally, but um, related to all of the above, um, I've really uh, come to recognize and grapple with um, the fact that the rhetorics of sustainability are quite fraught. Um, and complex and contingent upon different um, 
different considerations. For some, concepts of endangerment and loss as used in, a, in the statement and elsewhere um, remain very powerful and relevant. Um, they bring attention to and make an argument for the significance of, of practices um, and for the importance of, of research, the need for funding to, um, to serve those practices. But for others, um, these terms can uh, mm. call up trauma of colonial violence and dispossession by the intervention of outsiders and can create barriers to engagement and utilization of the resources of the academy. So this brings me today, 20 years on, as we join together in this panel. Um, the, the National Recording Project has been foundational for the revitalization and future proofing of cultural performance practices and knowledges in many communities and regions. And it's fed a tidal pull towards valuing of community informed research practices. There are many lessons, technical, methodological, and philosophical in all of this. Through each, what uh, perhaps occurs most to me is, a, is the need for a value of care to be prioritized, to prioritize the experience of those with most at stake in communities, both master musicians and those learning, uh, those supporting in different ways from different in industries and contexts, um, the need for, for the continuation of performance. Um, and also those who may be affected by the research either directly or by historical association. Um, I'd love to see us continue to work and work more towards centering this notion of care in the way we construct and value research in universities. Um, in forums such as this, which is online and open, um, taking place on unceded lands, often far from those, those of the communities in which we work. Um, and as we imagine, and the impact of the project in another 20 or 50 years, um, I feel like this responsibility is extended. Um, so I'll leave it there and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, we have three presenters and 13 minutes. So Linda, we've heard about the last 20 years. What should the next 20 years look like, please? What are you thinking? Thank you, Aaron. Um, I have a very sore throat, so I'll just yes. make mine very quick so that Brian and Hunter can have their say. <laughs> I'd just like to acknowledge the um, country Ghana people where I'm sitting today and um, <clears throat> like to acknowledge <clears throat> all the ancestors from right across the nation, um, <clears throat> this country that we often work on and um, don't... Uh, really, really um, acknowledge our heritage and history in the way that um, it should be done and ought to be done. And, <clears throat> and what that means for young people now and into the future. And one of the things that I really want to um, say is that without the National Recording Project happening back in 2002, um, a lot of the work that's been undertaken in that time has been absolutely incredibly important um, for documentation and recording, and that will be there forever in our archive systems and in the um, experiences and knowledge of the people who have been working on those projects. So having said that, um, moving into the future is quite complex. And um, I think that the statement that Marcy had read out is still so important um, to the way that we move forward with the new um, ways of operating in this space as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wanting to make sure that our traditions of um, songs, performance, dance, and our rituals are being recorded for future generations. And those um, recordings that are allowed to be accessed by external parties um, should be clearly um, identified as such. And that information should be shared globally um, <clears throat> because that's the only way that I think that Indigenous um, song traditions, dance traditions 
ritual traditions, um, performance traditions are going to be maintained in a way that's going to be um, kept in our memories. It's the reasons why we do this traditionally is because it's part of who we are <laughs> as Aboriginal people that are connected to country. And without that connection, who are we? Yeah. We're nobody. Yeah. Mm. We got to have that connection, yeah. um, and those connections run strong and deep in our blood. It's in our genes. It's we're part of yeah. we're part of the country, and the country's part of us. And so when we sing out to country, yo. Oh, oh, calling up. Yes, we're calling we're calling on our ancestors to come with us, to be with us. And that is what's important. And I would love for my grandchildren and great grandchildren and other Australian indigenous people to be still able to maintain that simple practice in the future. A lot of people, because of what's happened in the past. They don't feel comfortable in doing that, but they should and they must. And this is some of the teachings that as universities, that's what we should be encouraging, that sort of philosophy of Indigenous knowledges to be remaining strong in our curriculum, in our um, media, in the way that we market Indigenous knowledges. It's so important. And I think the things that Alan and Aaron and Sally have said I just reinforce that so strongly. And I'm sure that um, Brian Gumbala and um, Wanta, they have similar views and very strong views in the way that our knowledge should be kept and maintained. Um, and if it means that we work in recording and documenting other than through oral tradition and practices well that's up to each group and their governance committees to be able to work mm -hmm. out or well, their governance structures in their clan groups or their family groups to say that's what they want and that's mm -hmm. really really important and that way the the new um international committee that Marcy is now the chair of, they will be authorised by those people to continue that important work. And I think in 20 years time, we will see a resurgence of Indigenous songs, performance, dance and rituals. And I certainly want to say that um, since my involvement in this process, when I did my mother's mortuary, mortuary rites mm. and recorded those with Alan and Linda and Sally and other family members, it, it's just such an important um, piece of information that family members can go and look at and see without any restrictions to them. But there are restrictions for external parties to see some of that information. Um, so we did a platform burial, or a mitar, as we call it. And we had family, three ceremony groups, Wanga, Ledga and Chanba, as instructed by my mother, to have those groups there. It was the first time that Alan and Linda had seen that happen on, yeah. on our country in the daily Finnish River region. And um, and that was such a significant time for us because I think that might be one of the last times that we see um, where those three ceremony groups will come together. Mm. And it's one of the largest um, ceremony groups of multiple ceremonies in that region. And I don't believe that that's been documented enough. And if we can encourage the Australian government to 
provide more funding towards those sorts of activities to make sure that those recordings of those ceremonies mm -hmm. are recorded and documented. Mm -hmm. That would be fantastic um, mm -hmm. because at the rate that old people are passing away, that knowledge is dying with them. And Thank we're you. getting a lot of young people coming through now and they're not going to have a clue if those records aren't accessible for them in the future. Mm -hmm. So a very strong foundation has been laid 20 years ago and I think that will be the case in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank ah. you, Linda. Thank you. Look, I think what we'll do is go to Brian. Um, we might not have time to play Wanta's six-minute video, but when this is podcast online on YouTube, we'll make sure that that video is part of the package and part of the record. Um, but, you know, a lot of what Wanta says um, harmonises perfectly uh, with what Paige has said before and is an important aspect of understanding this as well so finally brian um you're, you're a very generous teacher you know you teach a vast number of people traditional song and dance how to run ceremonies properly um not only your own family but like almost literally anybody who wants to learn which is one of the most you know amazing things about you but given you know the work and effort that you've put into learning all of this yourself and and also ensuring that other people who want to learn can actually learn it too what are your hopes what are your hopes for the continuation of all these ceremonial song and dance styles and traditions into the future what do you want to see happen in the future i'd like to see uh, uh hello everyone hey my name is professor brian um, and I'd, I've always, uh, I've always, uh, I've always teach my kids and my uh, family and the other other clans and other clans, you know, which um, um, I'm like. Uh, uh, representative for for my people from different clans, both Dua and Irija. Uh, so I want to see uh, the outcomes uh, in booklets. Uh, I'd like to sort of uh, compose a song and a story, as well as a as a art picture, and a, and a sculpture, and 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 also um, to be able to uh, help my uh, uh, my last generation, which is. Uh, um, I'd say uh, I, I've got a grand grandchildren. I want them to be. I want them to learn what uh, what I've learned, and what my my partner has learned, which is my wife. Uh, she's a uh, she holds the, the she holds. Uh, a significant uh, a, a stick uh, where she can stand in the uh, ceremony ground, place called like like garma, but sim similar to garma. Uh, it's a uh, for 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 ladies. She she's got a, a voice, and she's authorized to talk to all the eldest ladies. And I, I've got the same particular uh, 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 standard of doing that in 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 a place called Karma, also in Yingapungapu, 
also in uh, uh, on other areas like uh, as a rep representative in Mork. So these, these like these languages are uh, the, the academic language is uh, in English. They, uh, you uh, 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 you go to a like a witness box or something or a throne. You talk to an uh, to a crowd of people that they 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 understand what what uh what my um what my uh subjects are and what uh what needs to be learned mm -mm. You know. <clears throat> so uh yeah basically yeah and i'd like to see a lot of other clan not just kubopingo clan but other other clans there's more to come and so i'd like to encourage them to learn their own language and 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 uh, it, I suppose compose and write their own songs and stories. Uh, just like I've got my own uh, story and song, uh, and uh, got my own. Um, uh, like both uh, salt water and fresh water, uh, we have a uh, two type of uh, like Jao Gumbula, he's a fresh water, and I'm from salt water, and we we have a uh, common uh, ground that we stand and and proclaim our knowledge. Yo, does that make any clear picture? Alan Merritt, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it does make a clear picture. Um, in the background, I'm trying to find a speaker for the next session. But anyway, <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. Um, Mgale, you, you are aware of this. It must be a... Ah, yes, indeed. Uh, the way what you said was uh, uh, exactly why we set up the National Recording Program 20 years ago. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you encouraging other clans to do what you've been doing and, and what uh, your late cousin brother, mm. uh, Dr. Yeah. Joe Gumbel, did. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting instructions that we should play. Um, the want of video. Um, can begin from from Tanumai. That's it. My homeland is a Barkley area. Um, Bo Bo is a name, uh, but my name is Wanda Wanda Tambien. Current know me as um, Stephen Patrick. Yeah. I've been involved in putting Milbury together with the Trax Dance Company. Yeah, or based on uh, not being satisfied in teaching cultural stuff for the kids, so we have come with, with the Milbury. Uh, a form of performance as celebrating ourselves as people, all the people. Well, like memory need to be recorded, but some ceremonies are now not, well, they're being ignored really, and we want to bring it back. Most of the people. Funny enough, young people like to bring 
see, put it again. So, put it, it's Jarevanpa. Yeah, Kangal, I think. But that's an odd one. Yeah. Where you go and follow the song lines. Yeah. So you are out there for nearly two years. It's really hard to do that one. But you know, we can bring it down to Kurigi, Karyonba, and just a little bit of Kangalo, we call it. It's a sky ceremony. And put that all together with the approval and permission of all the old fellas. Yeah, there were nearly 15 of them in Lakamanu. Really big men too, you know in our World Bridge Society. But they all passed away now. Yeah, the, one, the last one is my dad is still living. Uh, but uh, one of the other old men is old Henry. He passed away a couple of months ago. The oldest man. And they really told me we need to record some way save, save all these History, I'll call it. History. So they introduced Muragolo for me. And Muragolo is, yeah, law, ceremony, language, and skin names. They're all the priority in a system. But, you know, you have to learn them because they, what I consider is um, archives. Yeah, they have the history and deeper knowledge of of this country really. Not. And based on Walbury worldview. Yeah. And we have to put them they have to put them in the song lines. Yeah. And ceremonies. Yeah, the way you talk during ceremony and how you submit yourself as a as a member according to your skin group and follow that law. If we lose the Murawolu, yeah, what's the point? What's the point? We will be lost in our own home. We'll be homeless in our own home, they say. That means no history. And it's just a shadow of people. Yeah. Which is kind of sad. So, you will to put all this in the record. We, yeah, we're basically saving this country and saving ourselves too. What I was able to achieve in the last 15 years, uh, well first of all, yeah, trying to break that stereotype thing amongst my people and wider Australian too, is to bring out those indigenous stories most of them will consider it mystery, but now it is it's really essential uh, knowledge that need to be passed on. I can't see myself as someone with a family and friends that put me through these ceremonies. I can't see myself as a the end point, I'll put it that way. Now I, I gotta pass what I know pass it on to my kids or to whoever, to career too. Yeah, that's if you, you know, love this great country. In Wolverine we call it Katinka. Yeah, white fellow call it Australia. Okay, thank you very much everybody.
Um, look, we're going to have to wrap that panel. Thank you so much to everybody for presenting very strong, powerful Thank work. You. Not sure that was meant to be there, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everybody. Look, I'm I'm still, you know, I'm 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 hearing both sides of this. I think yes, the achievements have been really important, and obviously, if people had not been doing the work and dedicating their lives and careers to doing this work, whether on the community side, the academic side, or both, then things would be a lot worse today. Uh, Twenty years after the launch of the National Recording Project, I still worry, though. I think I think I'm still very worried about you know, the continuation of traditions um, that have been talked about in this presentation. I, I still think the work that we do is chronically under-resourced and it's good individuals who are making the most out of the resources they can find rather than, you know, any top-down support. So I think we really do need to regroup, keep our focus strong and keep lobbying to the future.